All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John W. McCaskill, and I'm certainly delighted to be here. Uh, I was waiting around because I'm like, okay, do I get introduced? And Don said, no, man, you just go ahead and start. So we're about to start. I'm so glad to be here. Certainly, I have to thank everybody from the Army Heritage and Education Center for allowing this to happen, especially uh, my friend and buddy, uh, Greg Hennessy. You know, he couple of years ago he says hey you know John we need to get you there and uh, so we finally done it uh, we're finally doing it and uh, so I'm certainly grateful for him and of course Pam who I've been uh, talking to the past few days trying to get all of this in place uh, and so we're excited today to talk about a topic that is very dear to me uh, the Tuskegee experience the sto story of the Tuskegee Airmen and let me just say that you know, this presentation is part of the Army's Diversity Weekend at the Army Heritage and Education Center. So we're gonna start talking about the Tuskegee Airmen. My goodness, uh, this story starts in uh, 2007. So this story starts in 2007. I was working for a company called Tourmobile. It did tours throughout Washington, D.C., and also, also Arlington National Cemetery. And I used to love going through Arlington National Cemetery. You know, I'd work eight hours, come home and study four hours, and then whatever I learned, you know, the night before, I'd try to use it the next day. They had uh, the opportunity for organizations to, to we called it a, a special, right? And you could charter the trams, and you can see the, the photo of a tram behind me. And there is an organization called Honor Flight. And Honor Flight has been bringing World War II veterans to Washington, D.C. since 2004. I am actually now on the board of directors for Honor Flight. And we just had our, uh, one of our meetings this past weekend. And um, we're planning some good things. But anyway, you see behind me in the uh, photograph that there's some World War II veterans there. And I'm standing there, you know, arms crossed, you know, feeling kind of good because I'm standing behind, you know, in front of next to some superheroes. But if you notice, there is an African-American gentleman standing right behind me. He's to my left shoulder, but as we look at this, he's, a, a, you know, just the right. Blue t-shirt, he looks like he's writing something. He's, you know, well, he was writing something. So we were at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. We were about to go see the changing of the guard, and we had gotten all of the veterans off the tram and into the viewing area, at least so I thought. This individual right here in the blue, he started banging on the side of the tram. Son, come here, come here, son, son, come here, come here. Well, I didn't know what was going on. I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is going on, right? I get over to him. Man, this gentleman whose hands were probably at that point seen 80 plus years of life had in his hand this crumpled up piece of paper and he pointed out, he says, there was the 99th. 100, 300 first, 300 second, and, and you, they just don't get it right. They just don't get the story right. I mean, he freaked out. I had just been talking about the, the 99th Pursuit Squadron moments before. And so he's he's flipping out. His son gets on, Dad, Dad, you got to calm down. You can't do that. Dad, Dad, calm down. And then the paramedics, two paramedics jump on and say, we need to take his vitals. And, and I was, man, that thing shook me. I thought they needed to take my vitals. So I walked off from the tram and I went down um, to the restroom underneath the amphitheater to get myself together. And I said, okay, I'm going to go watch the changing of the guard. I come out and I'm walking to the viewing area. And guess who's sitting between me and the viewing area? You guessed it. <laughs> Lieutenant Lorenzo Holloway, Tuskegee Airman. And I'm thinking to myself, well, just get ready because he's about to blow you up again. But this time, he was sitting on a bench, and in a calm voice, he said, son, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have got upset. I should." I politely stopped him and said, sir, you do not have to apologize because I knew you were trying to get me right. Oh, my goodness. That was a pivotal point for me. You know, we all come to these places in our lives when we have this crossroads, when we have to decide, are we going to do this thing or are we going to do something else? On that particular day, I decided that I was going to do this Tuskegee Airmen thing. And let me just tell you, my interaction with Mr. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Lorenzo Holloway made a big difference. 
So as we look at this Tuskegee experience, there are three factors that help to contribute or usher in combat pilots. Now, first is African-American tradition defending the country. The second is African-American enthusiasm towards aviation. And the third was the resurgence of the modern day civil rights movement. Now, African-Americans in U.S. military history. Since that first shot fired from Lexington Green, Massachusetts in 1775, over African-Americans have defended this country. And it wasn't always popular. As a matter of fact, when George Washington took over the Continental Army, he said early on that he did not want the very old, he did not want the very young, and he did not want blacks to, uh, to fight. And that was the case until it got to a point of necessity. And then they started bringing Blacks in. And some of them were substitutes for others who would have been brought in. And others volunteered. And I think there were probably about 5,000 Blacks who fought in the American Revolution. During the War of 1812, once again, Blacks were fighting, particularly in the Navy. People weren't afraid of, of blacks being on ships, but it was the carrying gun thing. And I, and I have to say that, you know, when the Second Amendment was written, even before then, there were ordinances that forbade blacks for having guns. So it's not always been a possible, a, a, a popular thing to allow blacks in the military, but many times it was out of necessity. But all of the time that blacks participated in American military history, it was not legal. Yes, let me say that again. It was not legal. It was not until the American Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation legalized Blacks defending the country. Now, the First and Second Confiscation Acts essentially said that you could confiscate your enemy's property, and I put that in quotations, um, and you could use it for your war effort. And of course, in that particular document, it, it was referring to human beings as property. And so they could be confiscated and used for the Union effort, but it still didn't say how. Well, then comes the Emancipation Proclamation, and most people think that it freed individuals who were enslaved, when in fact it did not, nor had the power to free a single individual. However, what it did have the power to do was this, Mr. Lincoln essentially said, and we know Lincoln is, is making these poetic and flowery statements. He just simply says, any man of African descent who wants to fight for the Union Army or the Union Navy will be allowed to do so. That was it. Over 209,000 men of color joined the Union Army and the Union Navy. 38,000 of them died in the process. And we have a photo of the first U.S. CT, which was uh, near Washington, D.C. at Fort Lincoln. And as I said, uh, and a lot of people were surprised that that many African Americans had fought in the American Civil War. Now, as a result of their efforts in the American Civil War, they finally authorized Black troops in the United States Army. Particularly, now, it's on a segregated basis, but it was authorized. It started out with about six units and then after a couple of years, it went down to four, the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments, which was all black. And of course, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, both of those were black as well. And of course, the latter two were uh, known as Buffalo Soldiers. They fought in the Spanish-American War. We don't have time to get into that. And then, of course, we roll around to uh, World War I, and African-Americans participated in World War I. The two main infantry units during that time was the 92nd and the 93rd. The 92nd fought under the American flag, the 93rd fought under the French flag. Interestingly, the 93rd got a lot of awards and recognition, including the Croix de Guerre, while the 92nd didn't really have that. And there are a lot of reasons. I mean, the 92nd was majority uh, draftees, and you know draftees may not be as motivated as folk who volunteer. But there are a lot of factors behind that. Long story short, the reason why that is important, because by 1925, they would have done um, 
an exercise or at least looking at some of the people from the 92nd. And many of you are already aware of the 1925 Army Report on the Use of Negro Manpower During Wartime. Now, this is online. You guys can pull it up um, and see it for yourself. But essentially, this is the conclusion that this report came to, that Blacks were lazy, leaderless, didn't participate in the government. Um, they were superstitious, afraid of the dark, were admittedly inferior in mentality compared to the white man, and were inherently weak in character than the white man. So what can you do with them? Well, you can get them to move a box from point A to point B, but don't ask them to do anything else. They probably are not going to be able to do that. Well, uh, there were some things would come around. Uh, let me just say that this is the lens through which the army was looking at blacks as we were going into World War II. Now, another factor that played in was African-American enthusiasm in aviation. But let me just tell you, it wasn't just black folk excited about aviation. The whole entire country was in uh, was excited about aviation. But guess what? The whole entire world was excited about aviation. Wright brothers start flying in 1903, and a lot of stuff starts happening just within the first two, 10 years of aviation. I mean, countries are competing with each other trying to figure out who can build the best airframe, who can build the best power plant. And so that competition goes on. And when you look at some of the evolution of the aircraft, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, just in World War I itself, it's absolutely amazing. Now, there were early black aviators. Bessie Coleman was one. She was the first African-American uh, female to get a license. And she had to go overseas to get it because no one would train her here in the United States. And of course, Chauncey Spencer is an interesting individu individual. In 1939, he and Dale Lawrence White flew a rented aircraft. I think it was from Chicago, coming to the United States. But at one point, they had a mechanical. And they had to put the plane down. And I think the plane was down for like a day and a half. And then they were able to, to continue. And they got to Washington, D.C. And guess who they run into? They're with someone else who knows a young freshman senator by the name of Harry S. Truman. And so he finds out that they're flying and they were flying to show that, hey, you know, blacks can fly aircraft too. And of course, we know how instrumental President Truman is going to be with the desegregation of the military by 1948. I have to mention this individual here, uh, Tuskegee Institute, G.L. Washington. He was the person who put this uh, flight program together. We're gonna talk about that program in a minute but he helped put it together. And he's the visionary down in Tuskegee. And flight training, and we'll talk about it in a moment, it was two years. And so a lot of other universities had their first year course or curriculum, but not the second. He started working on the second, and we will find out in a minute why that is important. There was also the emergence, this is the third and final piece to this perfect storm, if you will, the emergence of the civil rights movement. There was a push for um, equality in the war industry. A. Philip Randolph, who's probably best known as one of the coordinators for the March on Washington in 1963, was scheduling another march in 1941. And it was to allow Blacks to uh, participate in the war industry. You know, it was at the end of the Depression, the Depression was going on, and people were going to start to make money, and they wanted to make sure that Blacks could do that as well. So this opportunity in industry also became an opportunity for women, because after the war, a lot of these positions that these women would step into in wartime, they would argue, if we did it in wartime, why can't we do it in peacetime? And so it would be an opportunity for women as well. Well, as I was saying, they were going to march in June of 1941. and you know, President Roosevelt was like, wait a minute, you guys just want equality in, in industry? You don't have to march. Don't worry about it. I'll sign something and make it happen. And he, he signed Executive Order 80, uh, 8802. That was June 25th, 1941. And as a result, uh, Blacks were able to uh, work in the war industry. Now, it didn't necessarily pan out too well. I mean, there's stories of riots going on in these places, and they tried to keep those facilities segregated. But, uh, but there are other stories. You don't have time to get into that. But I also want to say that there was a push for determined to time Negro pilots. And one was Yancey Williams. He was a Howard University student. And as soon as they said, okay, we can take black, we, we can, 
we can take black pilots. He applied and they turned him down because they said, we don't have a segregated facility for you. So he was not able to get in. I will tell you the rest of his story. He did eventually get in and became a Tuskegee Airman and he flew in World War II. He was flying in Korea or around the time of Korea. He was trying to land in 1953, uh, turn to, to, he overshot his, his, his landing and tried to land in a cornfield, but he struck a utility transformer and his plane exploded and he was killed in 1953. That is Yancey Williams. Now, there are some points that we must remember during the interwar period. You know, this is when the evolution of strategic bombing theory really starts to take hold. I mean, let me make sure I don't end up repeating myself. Yeah, so World War I, if you look at the aircraft in 1914, it went from, somehow I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to end up saying this twice, but I'll say it now. It went from spotting and reconnaissance to strategic bombing and rules for dogfighting. What they needed was an aircraft that, a bomber that could go 2,000 miles per hour, I'm, I'm sorry, 200 miles per hour, 2,000 miles, and be able to carry 2,000 bombs. And we're going to, and they needed fighters that could protect them. Now, I have to mention one of the pivotal individuals in this Tuskegee um, experience is Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. He was a West Point graduate. He started in 1932, graduated in 1936, and he actually graduated, what did he graduate? Um, he graduated 35th out of, out of 276 students. And when you graduate that high, you should be able to choose whatever career field you wanted. And he wanted to go in aviation. He said, well, you know, uh, it ain't happening. But he ended up in the infantry. However, he never lost his dream for that. And one of the stories I love about him so much is this. He continued to prepare for an opportunity that at the time had not come yet. So, you know, he wasn't up two nights before trying to cram when somebody says, hey, you know, we need somebody to command these pilots, you know, in 19, 1940, 41, right? So he was already preparing for that. And he end, ended up being the only career up until that point. He was the only Army person in uh, flight training. He ended up graduating in the first class. Now. He took command of the 332nd Fighter Group, and eventually he would take command of the 477th. Now, there is something we want to talk about here. This is interesting. I don't know if you know about this, but the civilian pilot training program was very critical. It offered training to college students, but that's male and female, right? There's no attachment or commitment to the military, and I put that in quotes, because everybody knew at some point we were going to probably be in a war and we would be heavily involved. And when that time came, we would need pilots that would be there that we could choose from. And it's interesting because that pool went relatively quickly. But, um, but they started with those. Interestingly, out of all of the colleges and universities that were providing flight training, six of them were HBCUs, Historically Black College University um, Universities. Howard University, Hampton Institute, which is what it was called at the time, Wilberforce, West Virginia State College, North Carolina a and and of course, Tuskegee Institute. So those places, um, those six institutions were providing civilian pilot training. I mentioned G.L. Washington earlier, and as I said, he came to the point, where, you know, he put together the, the first year, which was elementary, and the second year, he got that in place. So when these first year students from these HBCUs graduated first year or finished first year, they all had to go down to Tuskegee to learn how to, or, or to do secondary training. Now, that becomes interesting because at some point, they're gonna be looking for a place to train pilots. And you're gonna see, and the reason, one of the reasons why they chose Tuskegee is because they had a track record of successful flight training. Now, pilot training in the Army Air Force was the same for everyone. It wasn't, you know, they didn't change the standards for black pilots because they didn't know everybody had to go through the same thing. And your pre-flight went through all of military customs, learning how to, to march, all of that stuff. 
And then you would go about nine months in primary flight training, which is the PT-17. And then you would go, and it was an upper and a lower status to your primary. And then you'd go to basic and you would fly the BT-13. It's got a more powerful, uh, the, the PT-17 was the dual wing that you would normally see in World War I. The BT-13 was a single wing. It was a more powerful aircraft or more powerful power plant. And then you do nine months of that. And then you do nine months in advanced training. Now, this is where you would determine or someone would determine for you whether or not you would be single engine or multi-engine. If you were going to be single engine, you'd be flying the AT-6, or they just call it the T-6 for short. And if you were going to fly multi, you would fly the AT-10. And then once you were sent, you graduate, and wherever you would be sent, you would go to transition training. And so if you were going to Europe or Italy, you would go there and fly the aircraft and, and do the training that was going to be germane to that particular theater. Now, I have to mention the college training detachment. When they first started looking for pilots, they wanted you to have two years of college. Well, they went through that, that pool early. And then they said, okay, well, if you just graduated high school, then we'll take you. Well, they went through that pool as well. Then they said, well, if you can just pass the entrance exam, we will bring you in. And they would do that. Well, some of those individuals, pretty much if you just passed the test, you probably had to go to college training detachment. And that's where you would learn mathematics, science, uh, navigation, things like that. And so they would do that uh, during uh, college training detachment. Now, the 99th Fighter Squadron or Pursuit Squadron originally and the 332nd Fighter Group. The 99th started out when they went overseas in 1943, they went to North Africa. So they were doing a lot of ground support stuff. They were... Um, they pretty much were out of the way. And I think the aircraft was probably the P-40, P-39. They might have flown both of those. The 332nd was, let me not get ahead of myself. The 332nd consisted of the 100, 301st, 302nd fighter squadrons. And it was activated October of 1942. And they moved to Selfridge Field, Michigan, March of 1943, and I forgot to mention, but when you were down in Tuskegee, your primary um, flight training took place at Moton Field, but then your basic and advanced took place at TAF, or Tuskegee Army Airfield, which is just west of, uh, of Tuskegee or Moton Field. All right, 99th uh, shipped over to North Africa in, in April of 1943, and they set home for a long time after training, and um, Nobody really knew what to do with them, and they finally sent them over. And they were attached to other units, but as I said, they were they were flying in North Africa first. Eventually, there was a complaint that these guys were not getting the job done, and it was like, look, these guys, it was a waste of time. Let's just go ahead and dissolve this group. And Colonel Davis had to come back home. I think they were in the Pentagon at that point, um, and he had to fight on behalf of his guys. And a lot of them just didn't think that they had what it took. To, um, to be fighter pilots. But all of that changed on January 27th, 1944, when in two days, the 99th shot down 12 German, uh, 13 German aircraft. So then people started to figure out, well, you know what? They can't really shoot down aircraft. There's no enemy aircraft in the area. And the 332nd began flying bomber escort June of 1944. Now, I didn't talk much about it because of time, but I will say that, you know, this whole strategic bombing idea was that, you know, between our four heavy bombers, the B-17, the Flying Fortress, the B-24, Liberator, you'd have a crew of 10, approximately as many as 13 50 caliber machine guns, and you would fly them in close formation. And they would benefit from the group defense. So if you're a German pilot and you approaching a box formation, you're somebody sees you and you'll be under somebody's eye uh in in terms of machine guns they did find out however the german pilots that the easiest place to attack was from the 12 o'clock high position 12 o'clock is coming at an aircraft nose and just up so you're firing down on the flight deck where the two pilots are well those guys are too busy trying to fly the aircraft and not collide with an aircraft next to them 
and they're not gunners. And even if they had guns to fire, they weren't rated gunners. And if you could hit a few of them, knock them down, the formations would spread, and then you would pretty much have your way with those bombers. It, once your chances of surviving in a bomber reduced drastically when you were out of formation. So, um, 332nd Winter Romitelli, as I said, they transitioned to the, from the P-47s to the P-51s. And I'll show you uh, photos of them in the next slide. I will tell you this, a lot of people believe that the Tuskegee Airmen never lost a bomber. That is not true. And even the guys will tell you that that's not true. On record, they lost 27 bombers in 205 escorts, um, in 205 escort missions. Now, when you look at the average, they, the, they lost 27. The average in the 15th Air Force, which they were part of, was 46. So they lost fewer bombers than any other fighter group in their 15th Air Force. But let me also say, if they were in the 8th Air Force, and of course the 8th Air Force sustained the most casualties, those numbers may have been greater. And they were ranked 5th out of 7 amongst um, aerial victories. Now, if we were looking at that as the rubric, we would say, oh, well, okay, the best fighter squad is the one that, that went after the airplanes and shot them down. But that was not their mission up through the beginning of 1944. The, the mission was to protect the bombers. And if you, if you had more bombers coming home, then you were accomplishing your mission. Eventually, that order would change in the spring of 1944 when fighters would be told, listen, you can leave the bombers. You need to go and destroy the German army because they were getting ready for the Normandy invasion. And they wanted to make sure that there were no German aircraft at all. The Tuskegee Airmen uh, totally shot down. They shot down 112 enemy aircraft. And uh, the photo to your left is a P-47. It's a wonderful aircraft. It's uh, very good for ground support because I believe it's air-cooled. So it can take a bullet and radiator and still keep flying. It, I mean, it can take a lot of punishment. The, the aircraft to your right is, is the P-51. I believe that's a C version. And the guy sitting in the may look familiar. Um, it was liquid cooled. It could actually outperform. Uh, when that aircraft showed up in the theater, everything changed. The, uh, the, the P 47's range was about 350, 400 miles. And so the Germans just realized well, hey, you know what? We won't, we'll, we'll let you fly. But when they turned back, they would pounce on the bombers, and that's what they did. So uh, with the 47, they didn't have to worry about other, they didn't have to worry about dogfights. But this P-51, my goodness, when they, it had a longer range and it was a much faster aircraft. I think cruising was about 424, 30 with the more emergency war power at about 450, 460. And you could do that for a certain amount of time. But then, you know, you'd have to get your engine changed out. Your crew chief wouldn't be too happy about that. But when they put drop tanks on the P-51, it was able to escort bombers all the way to Berlin and back. And there is a mission, March 24th, 1945, where they went all the way to Berlin. Now, I have to tell you that, you know, I just did a program a few weeks ago for the uh, Friends of the World War II Memorial Teachers Summit. And the theme this year was World War II coming home. And so a lot of individuals talked about the coming home experience. And I talked about the African-American experience coming home because it was much different from a lot of others. And even some of the Tuskegee Airmen that I've interviewed, they've talked about their experiences. Colonel Alexander Jefferson, and you'll get to see him in just a moment. He said, when he came down to gangplank, you know, there was a, he says, there was a white corporal standing there with a sign that said, whites to one side, uh, colors to the other. And uh, if you know Colonel Jefferson, he had something to say. Uh, he definitely has something to say about that. And if you know Colonel Jefferson, you can imagine what he says, but I'm trying to keep this a G-rated program. So we won't, I won't tell you what he said, but you can imagine what he said. Now, this next slide uh, it gives you a visual 
of what we have going here. The 332nd consisted of the 99th, 100, 300st, 300 second fighter squadrons. Normally, three fighter squadrons would comprise a group, but as I said, they had to add the 99th to the 332nd. And then the 477th Bombardment Group, it was the 616th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. And uh, they were training to fly B-25 Mitchells. And they were going to go into the Pacific, but the war ended before that happened. But their claim to fame is the Freeman Field Incident. Now, what was that? April 5th and 6th, 1945. 61 officers tried to go into the officers' club. Well, Colonel Selway, who was the commander of the 477th and also commander of Freeman Field, told them, yeah, you are officers and officers, according to regulations, are allowed to go into the officers' club, but you guys are trainees, and so you can't go in there. However, we will build another officers' club for you, and you can go in that one. Well, those guys were not going to go for that. And so they they staged a nonviolent, well, it wasn't a sit-in because they didn't sit down, but they went into the officers' club and 41 of those guys, 61 of those guys were arrested. And then Colonel Selway tried to get them to sign a document stating that they would be in line with this policy of them having to go to a separate officers' club. And it they didn't they didn't go for it and so 101 of those guys refused 120 of them were arrested and they were flown to godman field uh arrested and confined and the reason why that thing or or here's how it ended the black press got involved you know the uh, pittsburgh courier chicago defender and i think the naacp got involved as well and uh, it got such publicity that they had to they had to drop the charges. And I think one individual was fined for striking an officer. That was it. But as for the 477, their officer's staff was reassigned in the summer of 1945. And Benjamin O. Davis Jr. became the commander of the 477. Now, I got to mention this. Many of you have probably seen the movie Top Gun. Well, this Air Force top gunnery meet, the first one took place in 1949. It was out in Vegas. And the 332nd was scheduled. Well, they were going to participate. Before they left their base, Colonel Davis told them, if you don't win, don't come back. And I asked the guys, was he serious? He said, no, I'm thinking, I don't know. I found that hard to believe. But anyway, they went out there. They uh, competed. And they ended up winning. And in this photo, you see this trophy. And then there's a smaller trophy here as well. Something happened to that larger trophy. And it was missing for the longest time. And nobody really knew this story. And it wasn't until recently somebody ended up writing about this story. And uh, it's interesting because those guys were trying to go into the Flamingo Hotel. And they wouldn't let them in because they were black. I think the next night or maybe the night after when they had the award ceremony, guess where it was? The Flamingo Hotel. So they ended up in there anyway. And um, this was in 1949, just at the precipice of the Korean uh, outbreak. Now, I just wanted to talk about some of, my, I guess I'd call it my Tuskegee experience, people who I have met uh, in this process. Um, I, read, I met Dr. Roscoe Brown. He was a Tuskegee Airman. In 1945, he was credited with shooting down an ME-262. I think on that day, three went down, but to this day, well, up to the day he passed, uh, <laughs> Dr. Brown said that he was the first. And you got to know him. He, he had some attitude, right? And he even said at one point that there may have been some Tuskegee Airmen with without an ego, he says, but if that was the case, he never met him. So, you know, I guess you want your fighter pilots to have some type of swag. Uh, that was him um, later on in life. I also had the opportunity to meet Lieutenant Colonel Harry Stewart. His story is amazing because he dropped out of school after 10th grade. And it wasn't that he did, school was boring to him and he ended up just working. He was making money. Um, but he realized at some point he was going to probably end being a military. Well, he took the test, passed it. I think the people who took it, he was 
one of two who passed it. In the picture that you see on the left, that was April 1st, 1945. He was credited with three German uh, aerial victories. He shot two down. I mean, I, I, I don't have time to tell you the story, but he shot two down. The third one, it was an ambush. There were some that they didn't see because they were fixated on one group of, of German pilots. Another, another group came out, man, shot down two of his flight, and he was being pursued too. And he told me, you know, he went to the bathroom on himself. It was that type of moment. And he maneuvered, and the German pilot who was pursuing him cartwheeled into the ground. So he got credited with three uh, aerials that, that day. The picture that you see of him on the right, that was actually a photo from a he and Colonel Jefferson did a film recently. Um, I can get it to you. I, I can't remember, but it was they they told their story, and I'm telling you that thing is yet another invaluable uh, resource for those guys. Um, I got a chance to to meet them. Well, I did my thesis on on Colonel Stewart, the one on the left, the one with the blue jacket. And let me just tell you, the Tuskegee and De uh, Airmen in Detroit, they wear blue jackets to distinguish them from everybody else who's got red jackets, but. I did my thesis on him and I remember I was finishing up my first draft and I think I called him on a Wednesday and I said, Colonel, now how did you meet your wife again? He says, oh yeah, uh, you know, Captain Robert Friend, we came home. He says, hey, come on to the house. I want you to meet some people. And uh, so that's how they met. And I ended up writing that in my thesis, right? Turn it in. Three days later, I'm at World War II. There's an honor flight coming in. There's one from San Diego coming in, right? They normally wear the same jackets and hats. But there's this one gentleman in the wheelchair. He's got on a hat that says Red Tails and this jacket that says 332nd Fighter Group. Now, I was in uh, fighter gear that morning. And when I saw him and realized he was Tuskegee Airmen, I just put my arms up. And he started smiling. I mean, and, and his smile was infectious. I knelt down next to him. I said, hey, sir, were you in the 100 Fighter Squadron? He looked at me funny. I said, are you from New York? He looked at me funny. I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm batting zero right now. And I said, do you have a wife named, do you have a sister named Delphine? And he smiles and says, yeah, I'm like, I know who you are. Well, that was Colonel Robert, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Prynne. You see him on the on the left. That's what how he looked during World War II. And the pictures on the right is how he looked later on in life. And if you knew him, let me tell you, that smile that he had was absolutely infectious. And I spent... The next 90 minutes at the memorial with him, I'm telling you, it was one heck of, a, of an experience. The picture on the left, man, actually beside myself, and the picture on the right, I think that was right before he left. And uh, I did get a chance to see Colonel Friend a few times. He's got a Facebook page. His daughter still keeps his Facebook page going, but uh, my goodness, he was an incredible individual. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson, he was one of the first Tuskegee Airmen that I really met. That's him on the left during the war. He was shot down, I think, on the 19th mission. He was doing strafing. He said a round came up through the floor of his aircraft, out the canopy. He said immediately he had to bail out. He said when he jumped in training, they would turn, they were, they were, they were taught to hold your before you pull your D your your D-ring, your your rip cord, you waited four seconds. He said, but he was kind of close to the ground. He said he pulled it immediately, and within seconds he was in the trees. He said he was captured by a German soldier. And when he saw that he had uh, bars on him, he saluted him. I was like, wow. And he spent uh, about nine months in a German POW camp. And you know, Germans would put infiltrators in posing as uh, POWs, but guess what? Nobody suspected him of being German. <laughs> Picture on the left is he and I in 2012 when I went to interview him for the first time. We were up in Detroit. There was a Tuskegee Airmen Museum, which has since moved to a new location, but that was us there. And then the picture on the left, I got to see him a couple of years ago. We were in Northwest Washington. It was a bunch of the Tuskegee Airmen were together at that point, and I had the opportunity to see them. This is Sergeant Amelia R. Jones. Now, you may not have known it, but guess what? There are women who qualify as Tuskegee Airmen, not as pilots, but because of the Tuskegee experience. And I was at World War II again. It was Honor Flight. And this Honor Flight, it was from Savannah. They came in. And they all came out. You see how she's dressed. She was dressed like she was going to, you know, church or Wednesday night Bible study. 
And I went to her and I said, ma'am, I just want to thank you. I said, I've walked through a lot of doors of opportunity because you and so many others kicked them off the hinges. She said, son, you're welcome. I went my way, she went hers. 20 minutes later, I saw her again in the plaza and that's what you see here. And I said, ma'am, this time I have to hug you. And I knelt down to hug her and thank her again. And somebody took that photo literally five seconds before what I'm about to tell you. She then asked me, could I take her over to the woman's bar relief? I said, yes, ma'am, I could. And I took her over there. And she started telling me where she served. Now, I'm not a math learner, so those numbers are going in one ear and out the other, until she says at the end, uh, the last two years I was in the 99th under BO. I'm like, wait a minute, 99th was who's watching? She's like, yeah, I'm like, Benjamin O'David G? She's like, yeah. You know, I didn't know what to say. And I felt like I was on a game show with five seconds to answer and didn't have an answer. And so I asked her, she says, yeah, and I asked her those two questions twice. And she says, yes. I said, ma'am, um, do you have any papers to prove it? She says, yeah, my discharge papers. I said, ma'am, do you know you're a Tuskegee? And she looked at me, she says, no, I don't think so. I'm like, no, ma'am, you are. It's not just the pilots, it's anybody who's a part of the experience. So I said, ma'am, give me your name and number. We need to get you a red jacket. There were some soon-to-be chief petty officers there for what they call Heritage Week. and one of them i actually knew and and they were four african-american women three of those three of the oh the last thing miss amelia said to me when she left she says i want my red jacket and so they got on the bus headed back to savannah and three of those soon to be chief petty officers came up to the bus and said hey we heard there's a tuskegee airman on there can we go meet her we didn't say yes we didn't say no we just pointed to the steps and those ladies went up there and i thought it was only fitting because i said you know these soon to be chief petty officers to some degree are standing on the shoulders of Miss Amelia. So we started doing our research, our homework. Six weeks later, I went down to Savannah, Georgia, and uh, she was inducted into the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. She finally got her red jacket. The picture on the left is us. Once I found, once she told me where she served, and you see me cheesing bigger than she was, that's when I was like, okay, we're going to work this thing out. But that story didn't end with her getting the red jacket. A few months later, I went back down to uh, Savannah, Savannah Hospice Savannah, actually, um, and she was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. And you've got to get a senator or something like that to sponsor that, and she was able to do that. And the interesting thing about this story, there were a lot of people involved, and had, they, had, us, had we not put our puzzle piece on the table, this thing would not have happened. She was in hospice when we met her. She had pneumonia and was just cleared to travel the day before. And so she ended up coming and all of this happened. Let me just tell you, this experience changed my life. One year, two weeks after I met Miss Amelia, she was cleared for her final flight. She passed September of 2015. Colonel James Harvey, I told you about the Top Gun uh, meet. He's one of the two remaining uh, living pilots of that group. He was in that group, and I had met him before, but let me just tell you what happened earlier this week. There's an organization called Wish of a Lifetime, and he wanted to come to Washington, D.C. He wanted to, uh, he met with Space Force, man, and my goodness, uh, he said there were so many generals in that room when he met them. It was, it was crazy, but he wanted to come. He wanted to go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and he also wanted to see Dr. King's memorial. Well, I didn't know any of this was happening until one of my former colleagues who I used to work with when I was stationed on the mall said, hey man, there's a Tuskegee Airman coming. I can't think of anybody better to do it. You know, when I was on the mall, my Dr. King presentation was, was pretty good. I mean, if I start out with two people, you know, before it was over, there'd be 80 people standing out there. And so they asked me to come back and do it. And so I did. And so I took him out there. It was a private tour. But just like it was, and I hadn't done that tour in five years, just like it was then, people started gathering around. And I didn't, I was not going to say who he was. But at one point I said, ladies and gentlemen, how can I net, not tell you who this gentleman is? And I introduced him, man. They applauded him. It was an incredible moment. The picture on the left was us uh, early this week uh, talking about the memorial. And on the right was the colleague who I used to work with, and we were together with him. And so it was just an amazing experience uh, to be with him and his daughter. 
I have to say the person who I've probably spent the most time with and gotten so much from is 101-year-old Brigadier General Charles E. McGee. That's him on the right uh, during uh, World War II. His, his, his airplane was called Kit, named after his wife. And on the right was him when he got promoted to Brigadier General, which was about a couple of years ago. I have, my goodness, I interviewed him for my thesis. I have escorted him at programs for World War II. They have called me to do, I've been on programs with him talking about the Tuskegee Airmen. And I'm going to tell you, you know, the one on the, on the left was us. I don't, I don't remember what year this was, but I had on my class A summer and the one on the right, I had on my class uh, A winners. Let me tell you, I remember that day. That was a November and it was cold out there. And I was freezing, and they had these blankets with the veterans, and I was thinking, you know, maybe I need to get one for myself. I mean, it was that cold. And uh, but I'm I'm with Colonel McGee. I was like, Colonel, do you need a you need a blanket? And the UC all he had on was a flight jacket. He says, Oh no, I'm fine. Well, let me tell you, I'm thinking, oh, if he don't need one, I'm I'm certainly not gonna get one. And I thought at that moment, I had to do what the song says: straighten up and fly right. Mm, straighten up and fly right. So needless to say, I did not get a blanket. But like I said, um, I've had so many experiences with him. The picture on the left, we were at his house. That is Molette Green. She and I went to the same high school and the same college together. Of course, not at the same time. She works with uh, NBC4 here in Washington, D.C. And they were out that morning. It was a Memorial Day. And I was there at 5 o'clock in the morning. We were on television live. Uh, talking to him, and then he had us for breakfast that morning. I'm telling you, General McGee is so gracious, and to be able to sit at his table was was incredible. And the photo on the right was taken by Irene Johnson, who is um, Molette's camera person. And we were just standing, General and I were just standing out there, we were laughing about something, man, and she captured that. And I love this picture because we're both laughing, and he was he's absolutely funny. Oh, my goodness. And as a result, oh, this photo here, this was uh, 2004, I believe. They got the Congressional Gold Medal. It might have been 2005. The person to the left is Colonel Stewart. The person in the red jacket is General McGee. The next one is Lee Archer, who has passed. The blue jacket is Alexander Jefferson. And the one standing right next to President Bush is um, Dr. Roscoe Brown. I have had the honor to meet four of those five individuals. Well, Tuskegee Airmen, I haven't met President Bush, but you know what I'm saying. And it's funny because I have people saying to me, man, I wish I could meet one. And I'm thinking, well, doesn't everybody know like 10 to 12 Tuskegee Airmen? And as a result of my, my education, schooling, presentations, all of that stuff, I have had opportunities that I never would have imagined. Um, this was in November, you know, and this is one of the, Every time you take a picture of these guys, you know, you figure this may be the last opportunity. And I've gotten an a opportunity to meet them all. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel James Harvey's on the left, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, General McGee, uh, Blue Jacket is Colonel Jefferson, uh, Red Jacket is Colonel Brown, of course, Colonel Stewart is there, and of course, George Hardy is to the extreme right. And I've had moments with all these guys. And, you know, I do World War II reenacting now. And uh, so, you know, you see some of these photos of me in camp. Uh, that center photo was like a professional photo shoot. And, and actually, the one on the right was a photo shoot too at Reading. You know, they, we'll get up at 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock, we're out there shooting photos. And, um, you know, that's my Tuskegee experience. But, you know, the reason why this story is important is because, you know, Dr. Carter G. Wilson, the founder of what we know today as African American History Month, said, that if you don't see yourself in history, you will be relegated to a place of negligibility and you will be on the verge of extinction. And I have been in a school system. And let me just say, you know, well, let me ask you this question. If you thought your only history in America was that of slavery, how would you feel about yourself? And what would you, what would you strive to do if you didn't think you could do much? But watching these guys and knowing this story helps us to realize that everybody can succeed. And every Black pilot, whether it's private, uh, commercial, or military, owes a debt of gratitude 
to the Tuskegee experience because they proved that uh, the blacks could fly. And lastly, I'll say, you know, uh, Colonel uh, General Colin Powell said that given the opportunity, the uh, the training, and and a purpose, there is nothing an individual can't do. And when we're on the same page, let me just say, and and I and I think you know what I'm about to say this. Guess what? You know what? We can accomplish more when we're working together. We've got more in common than we do uh, that we that we don't have in common. And so, this is my Tuskegee experience. This is it. I'm sure there may be some questions, and we can uh, we can go with that. Um, anybody wants to reach me, you know, there there it is, right there. My website, my email, my telephone number. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>